Good morning. Thanks for being here this morning, and uh, thanks for your interest in research at the University of Louisville. We have an exciting announcement today about a grant that's going to help us understand more about lung cancer. To tell you more, I'd like to introduce our interim president, Dr. Lori Stewart-Gonzalez. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out today. We have some really great news to share. Um, it's news that puts me in mind of a, a, a comment from Nora, Zora Neale Hurston, 20th century anthropologist, novelist, and storyteller. She said, research is formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose. Well, for almost three decades, a dedicated researcher here at UofL has been poking and prying with a specific purpose. And today, I'm happy to announce that he's won even more funding to continue this groundbreaking research. That researcher is John Pierce Weiss, Sr. And he, along with his lab team and UofL's Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology, have been awarded $6.7 million grant from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Congratulations, John. This grant is awarded through what's known as the River Program. That means revolutionizing innovative, visionary environmental health research program to investigate how chromosome instability resulting from exposure to metal leads to lung cancer. That's crucial work for Kentucky and for our world. Lung cancer has, as you know, a substantial impact on human health, particularly here in our state. And it's time that we dispel, dispel the misconception that smoking is the only cause of lung cancer. This grant will enable John and his team to continue work both in the lab and the field to discover how exposure to metals from the environment causes the disease. We're grateful for the Institute's confidence in both him and U of L. We will, um, we are excited to see this amazing research continue and expand at UofL thanks to this very important grant. It's the kind of support that shows why UofL is truly a great place to invest. At UofL we create and apply knowledge that improves lives and this grant certainly will help improve lives here in Kentucky and beyond. Again, John, congratulations. Thank you for addressing and helping to solve this grand challenge affecting the human condition. And now I hope you'll tell us more about your work. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to present John Pierce Weiss, Sr. Thank you, President Gonzalez, for those kind words. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, speak to you in sort of two sections. First. I need to do some acknowledgments, <clears throat> and then I'll give you kind of an overview of the research and what we're doing. Uh, first and foremost, the most obvious acknowledgement I need to make is to the National Institute <coughs> of Environmental Health Sciences, <coughs> also known as NIEHS, for bestowing this award upon me. These are rare awards. Um, they fund a scientist and they're based on their history and their vision, <coughs> and I'm excited that they chose me. Now, while I'm the face of the award, I'm really the tip of the spear, and you don't get this kind of award without significant institutional support and fantastic people working with you. So I'd like to thank the University of Louisville, President Gonzalez and Kevin Gardner for their exceptional support as I was developing this grant. There were key moments in the grant where I needed that support reassured, and Kevin Gardner stood with me and made sure we had the commitment to see that grant all the way through. I'm also in the School of Medicine with a fantastic dean and a wonderful department chair, um, Tony Ganzel, our dean, and David Hine, our department chair. They recruited me here. They created the environment for me to grow and thrive in, and my team, I think, has done pretty well, and so I thank you both for, for uh, your support. We're also blessed here at the university with a number of centers and facilities that that support us. There's the Brown Cancer Center, which I'm a member of, but also the Enviroom Institute with its two centers, the Center for Integrative Environmental Health Sciences and the Center for Environmental and Occupational Health. And these centers provide a robust environment around cancer and environmental health that really allows research to develop and grow, and I appreciate my participation and involvement in those centers. 
And then there's pilot funding, essential pilot funding we got from the Kentucky Lung Cancer Research Program and the Jewish Heritage Fund for Excellence, which provided us with uh, short-term money to help us develop some in integral concepts in the grant. Um, and then, of course, <clears throat> uh, there's people who do the work, <laughs> or I'm born of the face, and <clears throat> it's difficult to thank and name all of the lab members over 30 years that have <clears throat> helped us get to this point, but I'm grateful to all of them, including the current group that's going to help me drive this forward, Jenny Toyota, uh, Aggie Williams, Adoya Miyatsa, and Haiyan Liu, who are my four graduate students, and then two faculty, Dr. Calvin Corcoran and Sandy Wise, uh, oh, she's over there, um, who will help me push this forward as we're here at, at the University of Louisville. And then finally, of course, my family <coughs> can't do this without excellent family support. And I'm not going to name them because I'll get too choked up. <laughs> so on to the research vision. You know, in my business, when you start out as a toxicologist, they, you, you talk about the chemical, right? It, for me, over the years, it's all been, been about chromium, and I'll tell you why chromium is important in, in, in a little bit. But I've been, I've been fortunate that NIHS has supported me for 20 plus years. And um, in the beginning, I talked mostly about chromium and how important that was. But then I got a letter from a citizens group that were lung cancer survivors <clears throat> thanking me for the work <clears throat> and the grant that we started. And I realized that lung cancer was really the driver. And this is a significant disease. And, I, and it doesn't get, they talked about the stigma of lung cancer when they sent me that letter. And I looked into it and realized lung cancer is the major killer in the world and in the US. In fact, it kills more people than the next three most lethal cancers combined. And we're talking in the neighborhood, you know, an estimate 140, 150,000 people a year die of lung cancer. So what's the stigma? Well, the stigma is smoking. Most people feel if you stop smoking, there won't be any lung cancer. But when you look deeper, this isn't the case. If you removed all the smokers who died of lung cancer from the analysis, you'd find that lung cancer is still a top 10 lethal cancer um, in the US. On top of that, it's a disease that particularly strikes women. As in, if you look at the never smokers, one in five women have never smoked. One in five women who get lung cancer have never smoked. One in 12 men have never smoked. So that's a lot of people dying of lung cancer who never got exposed to tobacco or never smoked tobacco. So what else is it? And when you, the International for Agency on Research on Cancer classifies different carcinogens as to the likelihood that they cause cancer. And they have a category of things that we know are human carcinogens. And for lung cancer, there are eight substances in the environment that are known causes of human lung cancer. And five of those are metals. And metals is where we focus. Um, and so that's where the chromium comes in and where our focus has been is, you know, what is it about metals that's driving lung cancer? And one thing that metals and lung cancer have in common is effects on chromosomes. So chromosomes are the structures that carry the DNA and store the DNA and move it from cell to cell. And when you look at lung cancers, you see you have too many chromosomes. Now, humans normally have 46. You're probably familiar with chromosomes because you've heard of females being XX and males being XY. And any deviation from that number causes disease problems. Well, in cancer, what you see is sometimes one and a half to two times the normal number of chromosomes, and they're structurally changed and rearranged. So what's behind that? Well, metals is a group of chemicals that cause lung cancer, and they mess around with chromosome structure and number. And so that's where we've focused. We've chosen chromium as our lead chemical because it's prevalent in the environment and it has the, be the, the best characterized starting points. So we can get there faster by focusing on chromium. Chromium's, you've probably heard of it, it's a relatively famous chemical, made famous by the movie Aaron Brockovich, for which I believe Julia Roberts got an Academy Award, which talked about chromium pollution in California. It's used to keep things from rusting. It's used to make things brightly colored. So it's commonly used in our environment and it's heavily used in industry. So that's been our focus. 
How is chromium causing lung cancer? And if we learn that, then we can learn tar potential therapeutic targets, potential markers to try to diagnose cancer early, or maybe strategies to prevent it. So this grant kind of sets that stage to look at how chromium is affecting the chromosomes in different ways. Now we're gonna start out in cell culture, so we're growing human lung cells in a dish, and we're gonna see what are the mechanisms that cause this. How is chromium taking a normal cell with normal chromosomes into a tumor cell with disorganized and restructured chromosomes? We're then going to drill down deeper in collaboration with Kajin Liu at the University of New Mexico to try to see where is chromium binding within the cell? What is it actually attaching to that's leading to the problems that we see? And then we're also working with Stefan Mundlos at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin to try to understand how chromium is changing that underlying structure of the chromosomes. How is it changing the folding and the scaffolding to cause problems? From there, we're gonna go also go the other direction. We're gonna reach out to, to human, translate to human populations because it's not just what's in the lab, it's what do we find in the people. And so we've arranged to work with four different groups with four different populations. The most obvious direct group is the uh, a cluster of, of chromate workers, so people who made chromium in Japan, where Dr. Kazuya Kondo has collected their lung tumors. So we can actually look in the cells and then look in the lung tumors and see what's translating into the actual tumors. And then Dr. Guan Zha at the University of Peking in China has a population of chromate workers, so people who work with chromium every day, where she's doing a prospective study following them over the course of their working life. And we can access those blood samples and start to see what biomarkers show up early in workers um, to try to better detect and diagnose can lung cancer early. The third group is with Dr. Tong Zhang Zhang at, the, at Brown University where he has a population of metal mining workers. So now we're gonna get into mixed metal exposures and look at the blood samples from those workers. That's a, also a population in China. And then working with doctors Matt Cave and Craig McLean, there's a population they've collected years ago here in Louisville of metal catalyst workers where all that had high chromium exposure, where we can also look there and see what's, what's happening. So we have a spectrum of populations and a spectrum of diseases. And then of course the thing I'm most perhaps notorious for is our whale research. And what we're finding in whales is that what happens in human cells is not happening in whale cells. So whale cells are somehow protected from chromium and what chromium is doing. If we can figure out what that is, we know they're protected. We haven't figured out what the exact target is. Then we can probably exploit that to come up with insights into therapies and, and prevention strategies in humans learned from the whales. Uh, beyond that, we have collaborations in the Department of Medicine and Pediatrics where scientists there are taking some of the principles we're looking at and applying them to neuroscience and liver disease so that the reach of us is beyond lung cancer. We're also touching on these other diseases from these young scientists pushing it forward. Um, and that's what I have. <laughs> oh, sorry, I need this, sorry. And let me in introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Gardner, our Executive Vice President for Research. Well, thanks so much for that, Dr. Wise. I want to commend you again for receiving this grant. And I, I think a couple of points. I'm glad that John brought up the, the, um, the whales because I was invited to go on a, on, a trip, on a trip with him last summer off the coast of Maine, and I just, we just missed each other by a couple of days or something like that. But when I think about John, I don't think about the laboratory and things like that. I think about him on the... On the <laughs> on the dory, like chasing down the whales, looking to buy, I was like, how do you biopsy those whales? It's fascinating to me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to a trip. And I'll also say that this, this work is near and dear to my heart. I spent my career in, in the field of environmental science and engineering and studied about how do chemicals like chromium transport through the environment? How do they get into humans to begin with and how can we stop that? But then I solidly stopped there and let scientists like Dr. Wise and his team take over to help us understand you know, the impact that those have on, on human health. Um, I think that you know, what I want people to realize is that this is a basically like a a Lifetime Achievement Award, an Emmy, Emmy for a Lifetime Achievement Award. That's what John received from NIEHS. 
along with a lot of money to continue to go, go do really innovative, visionary, great work. But they, they only give that to people who have 30 years of, you know, of amazing work to back them up to say that they're, they are capable and, um, and, and have great work to do, as we just heard him describe. So, so that's, a, that's a really impressive um, honor for, for John to receive and, and, for, and, and, as he mentioned, for all the support from the University of Louisville in the research environment at the University of Louisville that supports John and his team. Um, University of Louisville is a, is a research highest Carnegie R1 institution because of researchers like Dr. Wise. Uh, last year, we, the university brought in a record $201.5 million in research funding that funds important work like understanding causes of, of lung cancer, like John talked to us about. And these are the big global challenges that, that University of Louisville is committed to investigating and, and, and helping solve. As a university, we call these grand challenges. We identified three of these three grand challenges that we as a university seek to solve, and one of those is advancing our health by, by transforming how we understand uh, diseases like cancer and the mechanisms that cause those. So this, Dr. Wise is a great example of how University of Louisville does research that matters to people in society. Um, so thank you, Dr. Wise, for all the important work that you've done. We're really happy to, to have you here and, and support your, your work for years to come, and we look forward to, to hearing more. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, to John. Uh, thanks, Kevin. That concludes our formal, formal program. Uh, if any members of the media have any questions on this topic, we can take them from the podium. Uh, if not, I believe Dr. Wise and Dr. Gardner will be around for a few minutes if, if you need to do any one-on-one -on -one interviews. But uh, anything, anything that comes to mind immediately? Well, what really for me, what you know, the driver was to understand environmental causes of cancer, and the one that I got connected with early as a graduate student was hexavalent chromium. And um, <clears throat> typically, as a graduate student, you don't continue with that work into your faculty career. You do a postdoc, and you build off of your postdoc. Um, but I was in a position where I, I was working for a consulting firm and we had a question come up actually around the Aaron Brockovich case to evaluate some data and I realized where the chromium field was and there was a research a faculty opportunity at Yale and I applied as somebody studying chromium to drive lung cancer and I was hired and that is the question that has driven me. I've been fascinated by chromosomes. Partly what I like about them is you can see them. You look in the microscope and you can actually look at them um, as opposed to things that are, are smaller and more molecular where you, you're looking at it indirectly. Um, and I, I really think they're a marker of a lot of different diseases, which is something that, that is an area of research that's really starting to develop and grow here at the University of Louisville. We have a lot of young faculty interested in, in chromosome instability. Okay, thank you so much for being here today. I hope everybody has a wonderful day and thank you for supporting University of Louisville and our research.